So before we go into our text, um, let's just open up uh, in prayer. Father God, um, we thank you for the fact that in this country, here in Australia, we have freedom to gather in our homes, just like uh, the believers did back in the day um, when the church began. <clears throat> Lord, we don't have persecution, we don't have trials, um, unlike what some of our brothers and sisters across the world face. So let us not uh, take this opportunity, let us not take this freedom for granted. Let us uh, take all the time that we get, every chance and every opportunity that we get to spend time in your word, to spend time in prayer, and to spend time in fellowship. Lord, as we open up your word uh, this morning, um, I ask you to be with us and to teach us through your Holy Spirit, to help us to listen, even me, Lord, help me to listen. Even though I'm speaking, I ask you, I trust you that it'll be you who will be speaking through me to all of us here. Bless us because you love us and help us to be more like you, Jesus. For it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we're going to look at Matthew 18, 21 through 35. It would actually help if I had my Bible with me. That would be very good. So I'm going to grab my Bible. Now... Before we go into Matthew 18, 21 through 35, last week we looked at um, stumbling blocks and uh, I looked at the trend, you know, a couple of things that we looked at, but something that I um, did not touch on that I should have that um, was brought to my attention um, was that I did not mention anything about someone who is a huge stumbling block to all of us, and that's Satan. If you recall last week, I did not really mention him. It was not necessarily a slip of mind, although to some extent it was. Um, and then one of the brothers actually brought it up to me, and it was true, you know. The interesting bit is that last week, before church began, we were, you know, my wife and I, we were sitting here and praying, and we were praying for Satan to be kept away. So the very thing that we were praying for and the very person that we were praying about that God would keep him away from our church was a very person that I didn't really even give a, a, ch a time of day in discussion. But that said, it is very important um, that we understand that Satan is a stumbling block. And I'll just briefly go over some of the ways that we know in the Bible that he was a stumbling block. He tempted Christ himself. In Matthew 4, 1 through 11, we see that. And, and look, today I'm not going to go through those um, scriptures, but I just wanted to put that there, and I'll put that on the notes as well. So G we know that Jesus was tempted by Satan. Okay, So if Jesus is tempted by Satan, none of us are going to be uh, you know, able to say, oh, yeah, Satan, who am I? I'm a little fry. doesn't matter. If I matter to Jesus and you matter to Jesus, then we are fair game. We are fair target for Satan. Ananias and Sapphira, we know in Acts, in the early church, was overcome by temptation. And Satan was, in fact, it was Peter who said, why did you let Satan tempt you? Okay, so we know what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. They held back money, that was theirs to begin with, and lied to the Holy Spirit. Not to the apostles, but to the Holy Spirit. And for that, they paid a very dear price. Both of them lost their lives. We know that Satan can use our unforgiveness against us. And this is in 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 11. We see that where the unforgiveness that we build inside of us can then become like a poison that destroys our relationships with other people, especially within the church. It can be a, a, a dangerous thing. He will try to lead us astray like he did with Eve. Okay. Eve was tempted by Satan. Okay, we know how that turned out. Apostle Paul was tormented. And he says, you know, there was a thorn in my flesh. Many times I asked the Lord three times. It was more than likely three times. You know, remove it. But Jesus said, my grace is sufficient. But it's interesting that Paul describes this thorn in the flesh as a tormentor from Satan. Very interesting. Uh, historians discuss many things, theologians discuss many things. What could it have been? We don't know. All we know is that it had a, an impact 
a great impact on the Apostle Paul that he had to cry out to the Lord many, many times. Whenever the scriptures say three times and 12 times and, you know, 77 times, as we will see later on, you have to assume that it's not just, oh, Lord, please remove this. It's not gone. Oh, Lord, please remove this. It's not gone. Oh, Lord, please remove this. It's not gone. Oh, well, now I'll give up. No, it's usually a lot more than the numbers that's mentioned. Except in the case of Jesus rising from the dead, where three days was three days, of course, you know. I'm not saying that any time a number is mentioned in the Bible, it's a question mark. But usually in circumstances like this where prayer, and we will see later on forgiveness is mentioned, certain numbers are used uh, for a reason. Um, Jesus, uh, sorry, in the Bible we also know that Satan can only be thwarted by the armor of God. We see this in Ephesians 6, 11 through 12, to put on the armor of God to keep the arrows from the enemy away. And um, we also know in 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, where Satan is prowling, looking for opportunities to attack us. Like a lion, he is always on the lookout. So we know that Satan is a major stumbling block. Now, in Matthew 8, 18, 7, Jesus said, Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. Who is the prince of this world? Satan is the prince of this world. He's got a hand in everything. He is not more powerful than Jesus. He's not more powerful than God. But he has some extent of power because he's called the prince of this world. Then Jesus goes on to say, For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. And before I move on, I just want to give the example of Judas Iscariot. If there was an, ever an example of the stumbling block coming through a man, through a person, and woe to that man, Judas would be a pretty good example. One of the, one of the early disciples of Christ, one of the twelve, who walked, talked, ate, spent so much time with Jesus. And yet, in Luke 22, 3, it says, And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. Now, we have to be very careful. A Christian can then think, Oh, can I be demon-possessed? Be very careful when we are talking about this. Here, was Judas really saved? Jesus said, that he was not clean, that there was one person in the group who was not clean, as in he was not cleansed by Christ. Yes, Christ said still to die and be raised from heaven, but he was still there. He was there with them. The leaven clearly had faith in him. Sure, Thomas had some doubts, but not like Judas. Judas had an ulterior motive. We know he's a thief. He was the money keeper and he was stealing. He was helping himself. We knew that there was something going on from him from the start. Now, we know because we have the Bible, but the, none of the others, none of the disciples ever suspected him because we know they, they were asking, who, oh, Lord, who is the unclean person? But Jesus knew that there was one who was unclean. So then, when it says here in 22.3 that Satan, in Luke 22.3, Satan entered into Judas, it was because there was no cleansing to begin with. He was ready to be used by Satan because he had not fully committed to Christ. In John 13.2, it says during supper again, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus, to betray him. And then John 13, 27, after the morsel, Satan entered, then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Satan can use those who don't know Christ and those who don't have his spirit in ways that they don't even realize. I doubt at that moment when this was happening, that Judas was going, yep. Yeah, I'm working with Satan. This is a great partnership. It's going to go so well for me. It didn't. We know how it ended up. He killed himself. And then it says, the branch likely broke, fell down, and his body was splattered. Okay. So, Satan is a very real threat. The world can think whatever they want. The world can call me crazy. Right now, whoever is watching... You can come up to me and call me crazy. But I know 
that if there is a Jesus and if there is a Holy Spirit and if there are angels and if there is a God the Father, just as certain, if the Word of God says that we have an enemy, then I believe there is an enemy. And he is not a weakling, but let us not give him more strength than he has. Okay? So be aware of the tricks of the enemy. He can use even those closest to us, as we saw in the case of Judas, in terms of who is near us. So just because someone wears the label Christian, you will know a tree by, by its fruit. If a person goes to church, if a person gives, if a person serves, if a person goes on missions, great. Does that person have the Spirit of Jesus Christ in them? What is the motivator? Who is the motivator? If he truly, he or she truly has the Spirit of Christ, we will see it not in these great things that they are doing, but in the simple things. For example, you know, um, I was on the phone. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, Sean. I was on the phone and I was trying to put these things and Sean just came and said, no, no, you know, using his hands as a gesture, he said, no, let me do it. I didn't tell him to do it. I didn't command him to do it. I didn't demand him to do it. He was moved by the Spirit. Now, someone might say, well, it's only common sense, you know, you were kind of, so I don't care. No, I'm not going to take credit away from the Holy Spirit for even the little things that someone might say is little. There is no such thing as little in the economy of God. In the kingdom of God, there is no such thing as little. So, thank you, Sean. So, please be aware that Satan is a real threat to us and he can be a stumbling block. So now, let's actually move on to our text for this morning. And this is Matthew 18, 21 to the end of the chapter. And it's on forgiveness, you know, a topic that none of us need any lessons on because we're all so great at it. I'm kidding. None of us, I, I'm not, you know, I struggle. So Matthew 18, and I'm going to read and then we can go. Uh, into the chapter in detail. So starting at verse 21, okay? Now remember, the context has to be, ha has to be uh, considered in that Jesus has laid out just prior to this how to go about dealing with issues within the church. Okay, so now following on, Peter sets the context again for us without any break, in saying, starting at 21, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but to up to seventy times seven. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all that he had, and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of the slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So this fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. So Peter starts off by coming to Christ, saying, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother? So we know that he, we are talking about Christians here. Now, it's interesting 
that Peter uses seven times. When the rabbis at the time, in the first century, said three times. Now, I had to look this up. Where did they get the, you know, the seven times? Why the seven? And then when I researched, why the three? And so it turns out that in Amos 1, 3 and 2, 1, it says, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus and for four I will not revoke its punishment, because they threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. And then 2, 1, Amos says, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Moab and for four I will not revoke its punishment, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. So, the rabbi's justification is, if God doesn't forgive any more than three times, why should anyone else forgive any more than three times? So that's why they taught three. Now, where did Peter get the seven from? No, for Peter, it was just a higher number. Peter came with a higher number because he knew what the rabbis taught. So essentially, he was going, should I forgive seven times? Because, you know, everyone knows three times, but look at me, I'm Peter. Should I forgive seven times? There is no, no mention of seven anywhere else as far as forgiveness is concerned. So where did he get the number from? Why did he pick that number? It could have been any number, for that matter, above three. So Peter was going, how often should I forgive? Now hold on a second, uh, Peter. What about you sinning against other people? How often should they forgive you? Notice he said, how often should I forgive? He didn't say, how often should brothers forgive each other? How often should we as your followers forgive each other? He made it very personal. So there's a bit of pride and self-righteousness happening here. And let me explain. Matthew 6, 1 says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 20 says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So if the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders say three, then by going more, well, Peter in a way surpassed what the rabbis and the teachers were saying. But what was Peter really doing? Again, let's be very careful not to paint Peter as this, you know, this bad character. No, he had his flaws. We know that there were a lot of things about Peter that the Lord needed to work on, just as much as there is a lot of things about each one of us here, everyone out there, every Christian that he needs to work on. But thank God that he uses someone like Peter. I, I wouldn't want to be the object of this particular lesson because it will be a hard lesson when it comes to pride when it comes to self-righteousness we can all be guilty of this at times so Peter brings this up and he says seven times is that enough now notice Jesus doesn't chastise him it's one of those instances where there is no get thee behind me or none of that but he uses the opportunity to teach Peter and to the rest of us about forgiveness. So then Jesus says to him, I do not say to you up to seven times. Well, I didn't say seven times. Where did you get the number? But up to 70 times seven. Oh, so not, not three, not seven, 490 times. No, this is one of those instances where the number was used to say, keep forgiving lose count you can't keep count i mean we could try i could forgive you hey justin i've forgiven you for the 80th time you've got about you know 400 something to go after that we're done doesn't work that way okay so then we, we could try you know we could try that <laughs> i don't know i think i've lost count <laughs> um so Jesus says 70 times 7. Now, we know that this Jesus, before we even go further, taught forgiveness. In his prayer that he was teaching us, he taught forgiveness. And forgive us our debts 
as we have also forgiven our debtors. Or in some translates, translations, it says, forgive us our sins just as we forgive those who sin against us. Okay. Matthew six fourteen through 15, it says this, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now, um, don't take this as, oh, I'm, I'm unforgiving there, you know, with this person at this time, therefore I'm not saved or God has not forgiven me. It's very important to note that there is an ongoing sin of unforgiveness, which then means there's an ongoing sin, which then means, did you really receive Christ in the first place? Or, if you have truly received Christ, you might struggle with this for a time. Oh man, that person really hurt me. That person really got to me. Lord, I'm finding it hard. Lord, I'm finding it hard. Help me. Now that's different. Because Jesus will help us where we fall short. And we fall short often. So here, don't take that as, oh no, that's it. You know, I've got, I've got issues, difficulties forgiving this person. Now, if that unforgiveness, then, you know, if you forgive others for their transgressions, yes, Heavenly Father will also forgive. If you do not forgive, if you have unforgiveness, we know that Satan is always looking for ways to get us. How much more can he, can he do to us when our unforgiveness is visible to all, known to all? including the enemy. So be very careful with unforgiveness. So Jesus taught us about um, forgiveness. He forgave his killers. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. He's on the cross. He's getting crucified. He's in the middle of it. And he looks down on the very people who put him up there. Yes, it was God's will. It is all coming according to plan. But those people didn't know that they were only doing what God had already, you know, determined from early on. But they were still making decisions. As far as they were concerned, they ensured they wanted to kill Jesus. They put him up on the cross. And so Jesus looks down on them. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus didn't just teach forgiveness. He displayed it in the greatest way possible. In the fact that he forgave the ones who were crucifying him, responsible for it. But he also forgave us. It was our sins that led him there. And while we were yet sinners, he died for us. If that isn't forgiveness and love, I don't know what is. Love forgives. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Love does not act unbecomely. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love forgives. When someone hurts us, when someone, a brother or a sister especially, hurts us, if we hold grudges, if we keep tally, is the love of Christ really in us? Because that love, His love, does not hold anything in the back of our mind. Oh, I'll forget, but I can't forgive. A Christian should not truly utter those words. A Christian cannot. Will they struggle? Perhaps. But a real Christian cannot live the rest of their lives with unforgiveness towards a brother or sister. So, love forgives. Then, God's forgiveness. This is in Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. It says, again, you know, we've seen this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But Ephesians 3, 17 through 19 says, So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, this love, Christ's love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. You cannot tell me that if we have Jesus Christ, His Spirit in us, we can be unforgiving, amongst many other things. We can't be, it simply cannot be. So then, how much does the Lord need to work in us if any one of us here is struggling with unforgiveness? How much more do we need to hold on to the Lord and say, 
I need help. I need you. Work in me. Change me. Fix me as only you can. He's the only one who can do this. Now, Christian forgiveness isn't blind or shallow. Let me explain. Philippians 1, 9 through 10. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Great, makes sense. So that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. If I blanket go around forgiving, doesn't matter what you did, doesn't matter who you hurt. Oh, I am a Christian. Bible says forgive, forgive you. No, no. Let us not be foolish in the way we forgive others. In that, approve the things that are excellent. If it isn't, let's go back to what Jesus was teaching us earlier. If there are problems, approach the person. Not, oh, I forgive you. We don't need to talk. It's all good. No. If there's sin in someone's life, if they have sinned against you, if there's sin in someone's life, and you as a brother, the Holy Spirit is imprinting on you saying, go speak to that person. Whether that person sinned against you or you have observed this, go to that person in private and say, brother, sister, this, this isn't what the Lord wants of us. This isn't what the Lord wants of you. It isn't right. Again, who prompted you to do that and why are you doing it? There are people who say, well, the Lord said to me, and you know there's multiple daggers on the way. There is. People do that. Oh, well, brother, the Lord said to me to basically tear you from limb to limb. You know, because the Lord said it is okay. No, it's not. When the Lord says, when chastising comes from the Lord through a person, it will sting, it will hurt, but it is not to tear the person asunder. It is not. So that the Spirit can work in that person and be restored. Remember to win our brother or sister back to Christ. That is the process. So, approve the things that are excellent. And if it isn't, and if the Lord leads you or someone else, it doesn't matter. Go to that person and follow the procedure, follow the process that the Lord Jesus has given us. So that in the end, the brother may or sister may be saved and restored into relationship with Christ and into the fellowship of the church. I if I ask, the what, okay, so the question is, what if um, a person is not with the church? Does that mean, are they a Christian? Against the church. Uh, against the church. Well, then we go back to what Jesus tells about our enemies. Look, Here's, here's the deal, okay? Now, a lot of people may not like these kind of uh, words, but here's the reality. If you are an enemy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you are an enemy of Christ, you become my enemy. Now, how do I deal with you as an enemy? Jesus has taught us already. He said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So if your enemy is doing this, that and the other, us retaliating isn't the way to love our enemies. Doesn't mean that you lie on the floor so everyone can walk all over you. That's not love either. Okay? So, when someone who's against the church, who's against Jesus, who's against the Lord, against God, against the Bible, against Christians, when they come up to you, listen to the Holy Spirit. He'll tell you. Don't listen to the flesh. I think the key words there is real knowledge and discernment. God's given us knowledge, the ability in our mind, and the ability to discern through the Holy Spirit to be able to read those things, whether it be within the church or outside the church. Correct. The same rules apply. So it gives us that ability to be able to discern those things and use that intuition that God's given us. Right? Um, so in, in all of our dealings. Yeah? That's right. Exactly. See, the Holy Spirit... You can't talk to someone who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And that's why it is important. It is important no matter who we are ministering to. If we are ministering to someone, familiarity with Jesus, familiarity with the Bible, familiarity with the church does not equate to having the Holy Spirit in us. So we listen to the Holy Spirit who tells us, Share this. Be silent. 
point them to the scriptures. If they come back and say, no, I don't want to, I want to debate and argue, sometimes you just need to take a step back and go, Lord, pray, pray, love your enemies. How do you love? You love when you're praying. You can't be like, well, I hate this person, but please bless them. No, you love them. You can't pray for someone you don't really love. And you can't do that. You can't do either unless you yourself, we have Christ in us and we have His Holy Spirit at work in us. This is why it all boils down to the Christians that we are, the Christians that the church can be and ought to be, cannot be just something that we come together and agree on a couple of credo and let's now behave this way. No, we can only be truly in Christ when His Spirit is in us. And individually we are pursuing Christ every single day so that collectively we are one in Christ. So it is very important that each one of us pursue that personal relationship. This is why when I pray for each one of you, one of the things that I am certain to pray for is that you spend time in the Word and you spend time in prayer that your individual personal relationship with Jesus Christ will grow so that you might then have the wisdom and the discernment to speak when you need to speak, to stay silent when you need to stay silent, and to turn the other cheek when you need to. It cannot come through debates and arguments that normally don't lead to anything really. It just leads to more pain and separation and all of those things. So I hope that answers a question of dealing with non-Christians. However close they are, whoever they are, if you trust, if we trust Jesus and pursue Him with the Holy Spirit's help, He will direct us in all areas and all circumstances. And He will give us a peace even as He is doing it. So that we will know we are not doing less, we are not doing more, we are just doing just right. So, Jesus then goes into the example that He gives. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with a slave. So, He's now taken Peter's question and He's now about to teach us all how much and how God's forgiveness operates within the church, within Christians, and how we can then use that in our own lives in terms of how we recognize how much God has forgiven us and for that reason how much we ought to be forgiving towards others. So obviously the king here is God the Father. Okay? And the slaves is Christians. Now someone might go, well, I thought I was a child of God, you know, how can I be a slave? Well, let's uh, look at a couple of scriptures just to, you know, clarify. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus Christ, His life. He paid the price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And 1 Corinthians 7, 23. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Instead, become slaves of God. You know what? I'd much rather be a slave of God than be a slave to sin, be slave to people, be slave to this world, be slave to anything, anything and anyone this world has to offer. I, I know that I will be treated beyond my comprehension, beyond my understanding if I am a slave of God. And I don't mind being a slave of God. So, Jesus goes into the king who was looking through his accounts and 10,000 talents is mentioned. And so, I, you know, I've never done the calculations or anything. I knew that 10,000 talents was a lot. But lo and behold, when I actually did some calculations, I really didn't even begin to fathom how much 10,000 talents is. So, 10,000 talents... Uh, let's just break it down. The daily wage during that time is one denarius. So 
if you count 50 weeks, two weeks off, 300 denarii is the annual wage of a day laborer, of a worker. 20 years it'll take for 6,000 denarii, which is one talent. This slave that Jesus first mentions owed the king 10,000 talents. It would take 200,000 years to repay 10,000 talents. In today's dollar, so I used current minimum wage and used some calculations, it is $4 billion this man owed the king. Now, I owe some money, but compared to this $4 billion, nothing. What I owe is nothing compared to this $4 billion. So this is the man who is begging and pleading, saying, I will repay. Please be patient. I will repay. Could he repay? It was an impossible debt to repay. So here was the slave. He was a debtor. Now, I looked at some commentaries and Warren Wearsby says that he was stealing from the king. Because the yearly tax at the time was 800 talents. He had to have been stealing from the king. Doing some dirty deeds to get into such a huge hole. There was no other way he was making that kind of money. The text doesn't say anything. The text just says he owed. Could it have been that he kept borrowing and borrowing? Maybe. Okay, so I put Wearsby's you know, commentary there saying, you know, this is the only way. Now, because the text doesn't suggest anything, that's not scriptures. It's just one person's thought of what it could have been that led to this 10,000 talents. But whatever it was, the reality was the king was taking into account and he knew that one slave owed him 10,000 talents. So he was a debtor. This slave was a debtor. Look at his pride. I can repay. Don't worry. I can repay. Surely. He knew what he was talking about. And yet, in his pride, he was still going, I can repay, instead of saying, oh no, I got caught, I am so sorry. He did say, oh, please have patience with me, I will repay. Where was the repentance? Where was, forgive me, forgive me for doing X, Y, Z as the wrong in making this money or owing this huge debt? There was none. He was unrepentant. He got caught, but he wasn't sorry. He was sorry he got caught. It shows the attitude of the person, the heart of the person. And we will see further that the king with compassion beyond our comprehension. If someone owed you four billion dollars, I would struggle a little to completely erase. And I'm being brutally honest here. Forget 4 billion. Forget 400 million. Forget 40 million. Forget 4 million. Forget 400,000. 40,000 would be great in the bank account right now. And I'm being brutally honest here. But such is the extent of God, our King's forgiveness and compassion, that He completely wipes the debt. Not only was the slave in danger, his family was in danger too. They were all going to be thrown in prison, as was the custom of the time. So the king wasn't being overly cruel or anything. He was just following the law, the way things are, the established practice. But the king erases the debt. You're free to go. He was moved with compassion. But then this slave was also a creditor. As soon as he is set free, the burden of debt the burden of jail time, the burden and the sorrow of losing family, all gone, all erased. I'm a free man. I've been set free. 
No sooner does this happen that he finds a fellow slave who owes him a hundred denarii, which is four months' wages roughly. The same exact words from this slave, a fellow slave. No hierarchy of slaves here, they're all the same. The fellow slave uses his exact words. Have patience, I will repay. You see, when that slave said that, have patience, I will repay. He was telling the truth. He was saying, hey, I can work it off. Give me time. Have patience. This is possible. But the creditor was selfish. He wanted what was owed. Remember, his slate is clean. He's not negative 4 billion now. He's not negative 10,000. Now he's at zero. He can start building up again. So every bit counts. 100 denarii is still... Four months wages. Imagine all that he could do with four months wages if the slave, fellow slave repaid. He was only thinking about himself. And he was unforgiving. The degree, the extent, the magnitude of forgiveness that was shown to this, this slave by the king is unfathomable to many of us, to all of us. And yet, he could not forgive his fellow slave. He was not rejoicing. He was not going around jumping up and down and saying, I've been set free. I've been set free. I said, you free. Forget the hundred. No. Instead, he put the man in prison until he would repay a hundred denarii. Fellow slaves who saw this mistreatment brought it to the king's attention. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him in Matthew 18.32, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. He became a prisoner. Physically he became a prisoner. He was thrown physically into prison. But he also became spiritually a prisoner because he was unforgiving. He had no mercy there was no change in his heart. What a terrible place to be, that you would physically be locked away, but be spiritually locked away as well. You have no freedom whatsoever, bound physically and spiritually. What a terrible place to live in. But that was what happened to him in the end. So, What's the lesson here? Right at the end, my heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. We know Jesus gave us a procedure for handling a sinning brother or sister. Whether it is to us or to the church, doesn't matter. We saw the process. We saw that the process was detailed. We saw that the process was clear. We saw that God was wanting to work in the process. One person, two people, to the church. Then... Leave him. Let him be treated as a tax collector. We also know that Paul, in another instance in one of the churches, said, I have handed him over to Satan so that he may be saved in the end. He didn't say handed him over to Satan so he can go to hell. No, that's not what Paul was talking about. And neither is that. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. Notice, he says, the tortures until he should repay all that was owed. See, now it wasn't just about the money. In this particular uh, you know, example that Jesus gives, perhaps the king, the earthly king who is getting, you know, um, uh, well, who is trying to do justice, may be talking about money. But going back to what Jesus is talking about, the same thing that Paul was talking about is what's happening here. God the Father will allow certain things to happen to us. 
if we are unforgiving. A good father chastises his children, doesn't send them to hell, but corrects them, but does things to them that is unpleasant to say the least. Torturous, it said. He didn't say send him to Disneyland. He said torturous. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. How great is God's forgiveness to us that we are unwilling to forgive others. Are we forgiving of other Christians? God has forgiven us. Are we forgiving of other Christians? Ephesians 4.32 Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Colossians 3, 12 through 13. So, as those who have been chosen of God, speaking of us, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Jesus values forgiveness. That's why we are here today. Jesus forgives. That's why we are here today. Let us also forgive others. Whether it is non-Christians, love them and pray for them. And whether it is fellow Christians, brothers and sisters, forgive them. Don't hold grudges. You can have, you can have times of separation with other Christians. You can so that God can do a work in you as much as He can do a work in them. Nowhere does Jesus say, just grit your teeth and sit next to each other, pretend to hug one another, so that the world will see that you are my disciples. No, that's not what Jesus recommends. That is not His way. Be nice. No, it, is, it goes deeper. There are people who have grieved me, who have hurt me a lot. If I saw them today, would I remember what has happened? Perhaps. But will I then use that as a dagger? Or drip poison into my own spirit? So that I am a false testimony, a terrible testimony for Jesus. Rather, the Holy Spirit goes, I know, let it go. Greater is He who is in us than anything and everything in the world. With the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. With God in us, all things are possible. With God, nothing is impossible. Now, can Christians be unforgiving? Well, this is a hard question. Is an unforgiving Christian truly a Christian? Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, we saw this earlier, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Matthew 7, 17 through 20. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. I am not talking about those moments where you struggle. I am talking about ongoing, continuing attitude and lifestyle of unforgiveness. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit. Hard lesson, but it's in the Word. John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also have love for one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Love. Where love is, where God's love is, where Christ's love is, through the Holy Spirit, there cannot be unforgiveness. There can be hurt and pain, but the Lord Jesus will restore us. He will heal us. He will bind up our broken hearts. He will bind up our wounds. He'll clean the wounds. No matter who was the cause, no matter who was behind it, we must trust Him to heal us 
and we must seek Him so we can forgive others, no matter who it is, no matter what the situation is. If the Holy Spirit is truly at work in us, having revealed to us our sinfulness, our inability to earn forgiveness from God by our own merits or works, and how forgiveness is only possible through Jesus Christ, can we then turn around and justify or excuse our ongoing unforgiveness towards a fellow brother or sister, irrespective of what they have said or done to us? Not possible. Let the Lord Jesus deal with the offending party. We have a process. Let's follow the process. But if nothing happens after the process, if the brother or sister, we win them back, praise God. But if it doesn't happen, let us not both be cast out while being in the church or outside the church or behaving like one outside the church. Rather, let us ask the Lord to restore us, our heart, our mind, our spirit, our peace. And still pray for the other person because again winning them back must be the only thing in our hearts vengeance is mine i'll repay says the lord we don't need to worry about revenge we don't need to worry about oh lord get them get this get that no he who looks after us will look after everything The answer really is, if you're truly in Christ, though you may struggle for a, for a time, the Spirit of Christ, through His working in you and through you, will bring you over the threshold of forgiveness so you can continue walking in the Spirit in fellowship with Jesus Christ. And the next time you see that person, whoever that may be, through the Spirit, because of the indwelling Holy Spirit, you would be able to be the Christian you were saved to be, called to be, created to be. But if you are unable or don't want to, then you need to go back to the Lord and do business with Him. A good tree bears good fruit. Jesus said, Apart from Him, you can do nothing. And if unforgiveness is impossible for someone who claims to be a Christian, is Christ truly in them? And are they truly abiding in Christ? It's a hard question. Anyone can raise any kind of argument they want. Oh, it doesn't feel right. You know, who are we to judge? No, I'm purely going by the Word of God. The Word of God says this. My feelings are irrelevant. My feelings does not, cannot, will not overthrow the Word of God. This is not meant to cut us down. It is meant for us to allow the Holy Spirit to examine us so that we can be more like Jesus and we can be salt and light in the world and be truly effective witnesses for the glory of God so that many more will come to know Christ. We don't love based on our own understanding or strength, but we are able to love others because of the love of Christ that is at work in us and through us, thanks to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, you know, the Bible, we are grateful for the fact that we have the Word of God. As believers today, we can open up your Word and commune with you through the Holy Spirit and learn from you and be challenged by you and grow in wisdom because of you. Today, Lord, we looked at unforgiveness, and we looked at forgiveness, and we looked at how you forgive and how we ought to forgive. Can we do this on our own? No way. But because we have placed our trust and faith in you, Jesus, you have given us your Holy Spirit, and he is greater than anything and anyone outside of us. And because of the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we know we can love like you and we can forgive like you if we truly trust and depend on you and rely on you every day, moment by moment. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be salt and light in the world, to love one another just as you have loved us, to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us so that the world will know that we are disciples and followers of Jesus Christ so that they may 
want to draw nearer to you and we can point them to you Jesus so that they can be saved by grace through faith in you bless us Lord Jesus because you love us increase our faith because of your love and compassion towards us help us to forgive one another help us to draw nearer to each other this church and every church your church help us to draw one another to closer to each other in faith in unity in the word that we will approve all things that are excellent according to your word that our unity will not be based on feelings or emotions or man-made credos but with all that you have revealed in your word through your Holy Spirit in Jesus name we pray Amen.